I use neighbor's proof. First, first, what are the teeth that I will examine the frication involvement in it? I have the lower molars because it has a bifurcation, the upper molars because it has uh, it has a, a, a trifurcation. The lower molars I has a bifurcation, so I examine it from the upper direction and from the lingual direction. Why? <clears throat> the upper molars have a trifurcation. So I can examine it from the buccal direction between the mesobuccal and the distobuccal roots, but I cannot examine it from a palatal direction. So I use the mesopalatal and the distopalatal direction. Let's see on the patient. This is neighbor's probe. It is curved to allow accessibility, and this will be demonstrated in the instrument's demonstration. So I'll use neighbor's probe like that and pass it buccally in order to reach for the furcation. Of course, this patient has relatively a healthy periodontium, so there is no furcation involved. Of course, I'll do that also from the lingual side, passing mesially and distally on the lingual aspect, trying to reach the furcation of the tooth. Same from the molar, upper molar. Same from the distopalatal and from the mesiopalatal. When I find <coughs> a frication involvement, I have to describe what tooth it is related to, which tooth it is related to, and the classification of this frication involvement according to Littman's class. What is the relation of these gentle criteria to inflammation? First, we describe the color. Normal, pink and abnormal, we could find um, red uh, color. The contour, we could find the abnormal. Uh, contour would be a uh, rolled gingival margin and blunt interdental papillae texture, loss of the stippling in the core of the interdental papillae, uh, consistency being soft and pedentous. If we return back to the cardinal signs of inflammation, remember redness, hotness, swelling, loss of function, and pain. Okay? Because there is the vasodilatation in the blood vessels of the inflamed part. So this redness will be related to what? To the vasodilatation. The change in the contour, which would be raw gingival margin and blunt interdental papillae, will be related to the edema resulting from inflammation. Loss of stippling will be also related to the edema. Softness and edema will be related, of course, to the edema. But I have other cases which, which, would have, which will have inflammation, but these signs apparently appear normal. Like if uh, we are in the reparative stage of inflammation, the, the tissues will form more fibrous tissue in order to repair what's being disrupted. So I find the color normal, would be pale pink. I find the texture normal, there is return and may be increased due to increase in the fibrous content. I find uh, uh, the consistency normal and maybe more firm due to the uh, more increase in the fibrous con uh, uh, content that occurs in chronic inflammation reparative stage. So how do I differentiate between the healthy gingiva and the chronically inflamed gingiva that is in the reparative stage. It's only by one item, which is the contour. The contour of the gingiva in the reparative stage will remain rolled gingival margin and blunt into papillae. This is how I differentiate between chronic inflammation in the reparative stage and healthy gingiva. And of course, I find other signs like uh, the patient's oral hygiene, uh, or uh, local factors like calculus and blood, and so on. Finally, we'll talk about the mucogingival problems. What are the mucogingival problems? Before I explain what are the mucogingival problems, we have to understand the importance of the attached gingiva. Why do I have attached gingiva? And what is the difference between the attached gingiva and the alveolar mucosa? If we see here, we find the free gingiva, smooth and not stippled, 
the attached gingiva stippled and pale pink in color. And this is this red area, it is the alveolar mucosa. And this junction between the attached gingiva and the alveolar mucosa is called the mucogingival junction. So this alveolar mucosa is red in color, which means it's not keratinized. This is number one. Number two, if we apply here the tension test, which I'll explain later, we'll see that the attached the, the alveolar mucosa will move while the attached gingiva is attached to the underlying bones, so it forms a seal and doesn't move with the movement of the lip. What is the significance of these characteristics? First, <clears throat> being It extends from the mucogingival junction to the free gingival margin. How do I determine the mucogingival junction? By the tension test that I mentioned. I hold the gingiva this way and I apply tension. So the part that will move with me is the alveolar mucosa and will stop at the mucogingival junction. So this is the mucogingival pro uh, uh, junction. Second way to determine where it is by the difference in color. So this here is the amount of attached, uh, or the amount of gingiva, not attached. This is the amount of gingiva that I have, okay? This is a seven millimeter length of gingiva. But this is not the attached gingiva alone. This is the attached gingiva and the free gingiva. So how do I calculate the length of the attached gingiva? I have to subtract the length of the three gingiva, which I will obtain by having the probing depth. Here it's about one millimeter, so I have seven millimeters or six millimeters minus one millimeter would give me five millimeters. So here in this area I have five millimeters of attached gingiva, which is very enough, okay? We have a length of about two millimeters that is enough to protect the periodontin of the patient. This is the minimum. Some cases that can have less than that and still have no mucogingival problems, I'll explain it. So this is the importance of the attached gingiva. What are the mucogingival problems? They are problems related to the loss of this attached gingiva. First, I have recession. Re reaching the mucogingival junction. Recession reaching the mucogingival junction. Second, I have pockets reaching the mucogingival junction. Third, I have narrow zone of attached gingiva. The patient normally has a narrow zone of attached gingiva and first a high female attachment. Here on this patient, I can expect here there is a problem in this area. In this area, I can see a pocket that can be reaching or one millimeter far from the mucogingival junction. I expect that this patient, if this area is not treated, this will later cause him a mucogingival problem because he lose his attached gingiva related to this area. These four problems, how do I know that they are present and they cause problem? Remember the tension test we have? The tension test, we would use it here again in order to know if I have a problem or not. I will tend make tension on the lip. Normally, this tension will not allow the free gingival margin to move because 
It's followed by the attached gingiva that forms a seal and is attached to the underlying bone. But if I have no attached, enough attached gingiva, therefore by this movement, the margin of the gingiva will move. On this patient, we still have no problem because the margin of the gingiva doesn't move. But this movement will, if it occurs, will allow or make it easier later for bacteria and food remnants with mastication or speech will easily enter the gingival sulcus and extend a pocket, to form a pocket, and finally making it uh, uh, reaching the, uh, the bone, the underlying bone, and causing more unwanted problems. Okay? How about the high female attachment? This is common for the recession reaching the mucogingival junction and the pocketing reaching the mucogingival junction. How about the high female attachment? How do I know there is a high female attachment? The normal attachment of the femur would be at the mucogingival junction. So how do I know the mucogingival problem or the attachment of the femur is abnormal? Also by applying the tension test. By tension test here, the frenum should cause no movement for any part of the gingiva, which is normal like here, and normal like here. In some patients, this movement will cause the movement also of the free gingival margin. So, we have a problem because also the speech, mastication, or any movement on the lip, the freedom will move, so the free gingival margin will move and therefore make it easier for the bacteria and the free remnants and blood to enter, forming pockets and other periodic problems. The last problem we'll talk about is the narrow zone of attached gingival. The patient is normal and normally has a narrow zone of attached gingival. Let's say uh, 0.5 millimeter or 1 millimeter. When do I say that this patient could have a problem? The patient can live totally normally with this 1 millimeter attached to them, without pocketing, without recession, without any preventive problems. This narrow zone of attachment to will cause only problems when this patient has bad oral hygiene. If he has bad oral hygiene, therefore, it will be easily lost. This one millimeter will be easily lost by pocketing, accumulation of plaque, calculus, formation of a pocket, therefore one millimeter is lost. And we have a millimeter. This is the part including uh, the gingival criteria. Um, we move next to the description, how do I calculate the attachment cost?